just slowly panic. Yeah, and we just we're talk just like, like this, like we're just. So Bitcoin is a decentralized and broken up community. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's more like the Linux kernel than it is like a company. Is that how we're going to solve scaling through a combination of people through forums? We don't have a singular leader anymore. We don't have a Satoshi. We have an absence of power. Well, that's because you're the leader. <laughs> and I'm the leader and everyone. Exactly. And then people need to stop like outsourcing that department to somebody else. Why know? do you think people do that? Is that because they don't care? Because they don't modern. It's just like I don't want to take responsibility because you know that's kind of heavy and burdensome. So it's easier just to kind of like outsource that mm -hmm. and have somebody else kind of take care of it. And then if they screw up, I definitely want to blame them. Right? And I definitely want to like them to burn in the fire. And I want to sue them. Well, if you have so, Bitcoin, if you have your own private keys, you have that ultimate responsibility. But people don't want this. Okay, so. No. This, this is why people store stuff on exchanges because they don't want the responsibility of like sure. printing out private keys. Difficult. They've been meaning to do it, but that laptop isn't secure enough and it's painful. And then they know that maybe that printer can like you know store in memory the, the private keys. So they're worried about that as well. And so it's just easy to leave it on the exchange. And I'm sure the exchange knows what they're doing. And maybe empty dots could happen again, but I'm sure it'll be fine. I don't know me. I mean, it's happened. This stuff happens to other people. So the whole point of the you know the financial crisis and the lesson that we should have taken away from it as individuals is that we should stop outsourcing our shit. We should stop giving other people our you know, responsibilities. It's yeah. okay every now and again to, to hire somebody and subcontract things out, sure. but something as important as your financial assets and your future is finance is all about the way we relate to the future, our goals in life, what we want to do. So most people, I think, want money, but they don't know why. They just know they need enough to feel safe and secure. So what they really want is security. The money is just a proxy for that. So we're talking like the basic of Maslow's pyramids, the hierarchy of needs. Yeah. You need security, you need to be safe before you can go on to higher things. You're right. not going to be worrying about politics or any kind of advanced nonsense when you have a security. Exactly. Problem. Like yeah. you don't have food or bed or... But money so, gets you all of those things. Yes. So people know I need money. Well, they need purchasing power. Right. So Bitcoin, I think initially it wanted, you know, people were using Bitcoin to make more dollars. Right. right? And that was the outcome. Yeah. Right. And people were using Bitcoin as an investment vehicle, so they get in at one price and they get out at another price and then they settle and they get their dollars. But then over time, other altcoins came out like Litecoin and what happened then was all the ASIC, all the miners that were mining the graphics card were being pushed out by the ASIC miners. Right. So Litecoin, Feathercoin, Barbecue Coin, all these uh, scripts coins came out that were then graphics card friendly. So all the graphics card miners that were pushed out of Bitcoin moved into, into these coins and then they were trading Litecoins for Bitcoins. And so now they didn't hold the Litecoins. This was like they weren't like, oh my, I've got right. Litecoins. So this was like 2012, 13, uh, well, 11, 12, 13. There was a market where people were just using Bitcoin to make more dollars. Then other altcoins emerged and people were using those altcoins to make more Bitcoins to make more dollars. But then at some point when Bitcoin kind of went up to 260, came back down to 50 and then went off for a thousand, people started to realize that maybe Bitcoin itself is something worth having, right? Right. Rather than making the dollars, maybe I just want to keep the Bitcoins. And I've heard that story from early miners. They mined a lot of Bitcoin, but they ended up with dollars mm -hmm. and boy, did they wish they just held yeah. the Bitcoin. In fact, actually you hear traders say that a lot, like every fiat trade they made, they were Right in yeah, but even you still when you hear that, that you're sleeping dollars, yeah. you feel safe. Yeah, uh, but now it happens reverse. overnight. You think it's the reverse. Now it's the reverse. Yeah. So when we went down and we retested 200 again for the longest time, it was like 16, 18 months. I think everyone felt very depressed at that time, but I think there was a big conflict going on between the miners and they were trying to push the price down and make mining uneconomical. Didn't work because it turns out the the, the um, incentive engineering that Satoshi put in actually seemed to work in that case. We had the next halving that we had last year mm -hmm. and that turned out to be a big very bullish for Bitcoin and went back up past 300 sailed through 450 went up to 600 came back down again settled we had the Bitfinex hack that set us back but Bitfinex responded they, they issued a token and then they came back online it, I, I wonder whether you know we would be in this position now had Bitfinex done an empty got to then if they had just disappeared I think that would have been very bad for me well it's interesting but, you bring it up and I'm not sure you want to talk about it but they did do an interesting solution there. Mt. Gox did the traditional solution. They went bankrupt. There's a court proceeding and they're no trying- No one's seen a penny. No one's seen a penny. <laughs> they're trying to get the money Still. back, but this is the traditional yeah. system and essentially the standard yeah. option. What Bitfinex did very famously, and this is public, they printed a debt token 
gave it to the people, mm. it was traded, it was up down, it was 50 cents on the dollar. So instead of losing all of your money, you at least got it back in the form of this token, which you could hold or sell. And then there's a trade. So a few things That's to say. It. First of all, sure. Poloniex did this, I think, already similar, something similar. Okay. Poloniex were hacked. They basically promised to pay people back. There wasn't right. a token as such, but there was like an IOU built right. in. I wasn't a user of Poloniex, so I don't know. I'm just hearing this from other people. Mm -hmm. So what Bitfinex tried to do is give people the time value of money, which means that you, we understand that you would rather have some immediate relief now, even if it's not full and you know complete, so that you can at least get back into your trading and be okay, there's, there's a haircut. Pay your bills. Yeah. And you, yeah. Or you can just like start trading again. Because you remember for a lot of day traders, this hack could have just been reduced to nothing more than an average margin call for them. Sure. Right? Um, and so I think it's important to understand that they wanted to give, from that point of view, they wanted to give their customers the, the option of having as much of their money as quickly as possible. Because for a trader, so time is just, money. So they exactly. are losing time, they're losing money, they can't work. Yeah. And I know for, you know, if you're sweeping and you're working a real job, sitting at a computer looking at numbers and timing things is not work, but to these people that's their work, they're traders, they yeah. work. They that's are right. information, timing, yeah. markets, charts. So if companies. your preference was just to take the coins off the exchange, you could do that. If your preference was to keep them on there and double down, mm -hmm. it, you know, go into the BFX token, you could do that too, or you could do whatever, you had choices. Uh, but better than, empty gots where you don't see anything, no one knows anything. We, we keep having to like... The platform disappears. This platform disappears, everyone's in a state of limbo, no one knows what's going on. What you had is some degree of closure. You had some degree of like the option of walking away if you wanted to. And I think it's questionable whether or not Bitcoin would have reached again for those all-time highs of 1200 had Bitfinex not responded like the way it did. But it did, we're here where we are now, and Bitcoin again is challenged because of the SEC rule. And again, we've seen at the time of filming that we're still above 1100 yep. right now. It went down, the market priced it in, and Bitcoin bounces back again. And I expect it, my expectation personally is that it will do the same with, with this whole hard fork. I don't see this as a binary big blocker versus small blocker thing. Hard, and I think it's completely unhelpful way, to yeah. characterize it that way. I think people characterize it that way because it's convenient we're, to we're put things we're... in nice tidy piles. It's like you're over here and you fit into this box and you believe that and I believe this, but it's not true. Like we all have different overlapping conflicting beliefs. Well, as someone who's been called a Bitcoin maximalist, other people we're, will always tell you what you are. We're an us, me, them type world. We're in a Democrat, Republican, a two pole world. I think there is an well, attempt to try to understand the, the world that way. I'm in this team. That's what and they you want. Got for that team. And you do have, you have strident leaders, you have uh, kind of cult leaders that believe their thoughts and are not going to change no matter what. We're seeing a religious devotion here. It's a Yeah, it's religious, it's right? Yes, uh, it's bullshit. Well, I thought we had yeah, yeah, evolved that. But remember, religion is the, the taboo subject, the thing we cannot talk about. We can't compare or contrast. We can't bring these two together because we have to respect each other's beliefs. So how can we ever bring these two I to respect your belief, your belief As a big blocker, you have to say, hey, big blocker, I respect your belief. You want more transactions? You have to say, small blocker, I respect your belief. You want to go slow and steady. How do we bring these two churches together, especially if we respect all their beliefs, if we're supposed to? So for a start, stop trying to make other people believe what you believe. Well, and have to, the consensus, the two, vote. I need, I need them to other people for your beliefs either. Like, don't go to your team and try to find your, you know, your your community. Don't try to find your tribe and then go. Okay, I, I was on Reddit the other day and this person like cut me down with this really big argument. What do I say back? Oh, this is my stop response. Like censorship. Yeah, censorship. Um, all these things just aren't helpful and they're not productive and nobody learns anything. Nobody grows and. I don't know what the answer is, and if you're honest, neither do you, and neither does anybody else. And we have to kind of work these things out. And this is a scientific experiment. I personally favour conservatism. Yeah. I don't want to try anything too risky. It's not that I don't want bigger blocks. Sure. I do want bigger blocks. But right. I mean, first of all, I want security. I and mean, first of all, I don't want any kind of contentious issues getting in the way. But I'm not going to start name calling. I'm not going to go on Twitter and start campaigning and making funny jokes, even if I do laugh at some of them. You know, <laughs> but. The point well, is that you're not, I'm not picking a team and going with it and trying to force other people to believe what I believe. I'm going to listen first. Are, are we really seeing two competitive views of Bitcoin? Is there one that you're using transactionally to buy Starbucks every day, to spend casually? Is there one that's a settlement layer for like buying a house or a large business deal, large amounts of money? Are these conflicting? Can they work together? 
Which Bitcoin did we start with? Well, let's like, start with principles, right. right? One principle is the concept of affordances, right? In technology, we talk about affordances, okay? This Starbucks coffee and its plastic cup has the affordance of containing a liquid drink. And then with this straw, has the affordance of me being able to drink this drink conveniently from this, from this coffee cup, okay? And that's an affordance. It works also quite nicely as a paperweight, but I tried using it as a doorstop and it failed hopelessly. It does not work well as a doorstop. It does not have that, that affordance. I want the cup to be heavier. Let's for doorstop. You start with the concept of affordances. Does the Bitcoin blockchain right now, with its one megabyte capacity, have the affordance of Visa? No, it doesn't. Question, should it? Well, let's think. In order for it to be able to do 7,000 transactions a second, it's going to need block sizes in the order of magnitude of many, many gigabytes. Not two, two megabytes, two not, two eight not eight megabytes, not eight megabytes, not 32 eight. megabytes. Okay. It's going to need gigabytes. And then that's going to put a pressure somewhere in the system. So now, like a plumber, you've got to look at the whole system, right, right. top to bottom, it's and you've got to work out trouble. where's the trigger Seriously. point. Like if you're an architect, that's right. it. Where's the pressure point? Which part of this structure is going to take the most weight bearing? And what's that going to be? It's going to be the bandwidth. Okay, it's going to be the latency on the on the actual internet, the networks, the tubes, the hubs that we use at the moment yeah. with all these telecoms networks. In certain places of the world, yeah, you can get 50 meg down, 10 meg up. Some parts of the world get 100 meg. But if you go to you know certain parts of Africa, you'll be lucky to get half a meg or even you know 50k, quite frankly. And anyway, it's going to cost you 15 bucks a day, and you know access to Facebook will be free. But you're going to have to pay for everywhere else. Does does it matter if Africa right. can't mine or China? Exactly. Okay, let's exactly. pick another example. If we cut them off, I mean, what if we only mine in the U.S. or India or, India. or is that you know, really bad? or anywhere that isn't Western Europe and America and not and USA, USA and Canada, and, 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 and actually even parts of the US have really shitty yeah. internet too. So I. The problem is, like, you, if you're building this, okay, so if you live in a nice, you know, apartment in Shoreditch in London or you live in San Francisco, you're probably thinking, what's the problem here? I got 50 meg up, I got 10, you know, what's the problem? Well, the problem is you're not, you're not in 90% of the rest of the planet. So maybe you don't appreciate that increasing the block size, like, you know, in this very expeditious way is just going to put a pressure on a part of the network infrastructure, which we as developers don't have control over. I, I can't today go to T-Mobile or BT in the UK and tell them to put broadband fiber, you know, high-speed internet into everyone's home. I can't go to Botswana and mandate that they give everyone 100 meg internet connections. Right. That's, just, that's going to take time. It's going to take cooperation between state and industry. And not, not that I'm a particular fan of the, first, of the former, but it's going to take, it's, it's a problem of geography and it's a problem of engineering. And engineering is about fault tolerance. And it's out of the, the, the scope of the Bitcoin developers to solve that problem. All they can do is work within the limitations that they have. So it's not a question of whether or not we want big blocks. It really, the question most people are asking is, what's the time frame? Right. Now, these businesses, it's true, you've alluded to it, they have certain investment. And with sure. that investment comes a term sheet and a certain runway, as they call it, or a timetable yes, for yeah. what expectations the investors uh, have of that business to give what's called a return on that. It's an ROI, okay? So the investors will normally give an entrepreneur and CTOs as technicians a term sheet with some key performance indicators, some metrics, some things to achieve, okay? Right. You've got to unlock, it's like playing the X, but you've got to unlock an achievement in certain ways. you got a thousand users a user, month. Hockey stick get, graph. Hockey stick graph. Yeah. And, um, and as an entrepreneur, there's lots of growth hacking you can do. So you can cheat this, right? You can say, okay, now we're gonna make it so that users can sign up via the Twitter thing, so they just log in with Twitter. And even though we don't actually capture them as a user, we still get some of their personal identifiable information. So we'll call that a new sign up, right, like that. Okay. So, so, so you're there with your CTO and it's like, oh shit, we just came out with a huge sound of really angry. We don't know if we're going to get our renewed terms and, you know, I've got to pay for this uh, loft apartment here. It's not, and, and, these, and these lattes aren't cheap, right? So they are going to pay for, my lifestyle is going to pay for itself. So shit, what are we going to do? How are we going to get a thousand new users a month? Well, who do we know that can help promote? So let's get him, let's get our mate that runs that YouTube channel. Let's get him to promote stuff. And let's, and let's say from now on, a new user isn't someone who signs in with their email, puts in their name and KYCs themselves. Let's just call it someone who, you know, tweets at our account and then we'll just like put them on a table in the database and right. call it a sign up. And then next month or next quarter, we can go back and say, we've got a thousand users. Sound good? Okay, great. We all happy with that? We're not lying, are we? No, we're not being dishonest. 
And so the problem is, it creates these kind of negative externalities. Sure. Okay, this term sheet culture of like quarterly or monthly kind of metric well, score. Well, we, we understand their demands. We understand right. their business and how they're but working. You try but what about these small blockers? Why are they blocking Who the are these people? Who are what are you talking about? Core. I don't know what that Bitcoin is. Bitcoin core is, well, whatever the opposite of a big blocker is. So I would say so this is a full stack segregated with like binary like thinking. That is the world. Nuance. It's a world of polls. No, the world is complex. It's a nuanced space. I understand you can divide it up and you can section it. But just because your map of the world, your map of the world is not equal to the world. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, you can choose to see it any way you want, but the world doesn't give a fuck. Like if you, I can say it's one blue in the face, there's no wall there, but if I keep running in that direction, I'm still gonna fucking hit the wall. Not <laughs> if you're Harry Potter. So you're still faced with physics at the end of the day. You're still faced with the brute facts right. of the matter. And if you try going up to bigger blocks, for example, today, if you went up to 8 meg, 32 meg, all it's going to do is push all the full nodes into data centers, mm. okay? And then you're going to deal with a sort of a pseudo-professional class of people who are going to be running full nodes from data centers. And, and the network and is less is distributed globally. It's yeah. in less countries because less countries have the bandwidth requirements yeah. to serve my bigger blocks. So, to answer your question in the spirit in which you meant it, I won't call them small blockers, so I don't like this terminology, but I think what Core has been trying to do is make Bitcoin more accessible right. by allowing things, for example, like pruning, which means that you can say, okay, I don't want the blockchain to ever go over 100 gigabytes or 90 gigabytes, sure. whatever your map memory requirements are, and it will start pruning backwards from the oldest, uh, sorry, forwards in time, backwards from the oldest uh, transactions in the chain. Which, which yeah. makes sense. We don't carry around financial data from but the what that means is even though it's still available. Your full node, if you prune it, your full node will not be able to bootstrap somebody else's full node from the beginning of time. It will only be able to kick in from whenever it kicked in. You can also put in limits on the bandwidth. You can say how many megabytes you want to go through your node every day. Right, right. And so this gives Bitcoin more flexibility. It gives it more accessibility. Mm -hmm. It means that more people can engage and interact with, with, with the full node. It means that it incentivizes fewer people to take shortcuts and for example, use light wallets and SVD nodes. That makes the network more resilient because it has more diversity. Right. Diversity is resilience. And diversity means that you have lots of more different beliefs. Yes, that's going to mean that it's going to be harder to reach consensus, but it should be hard. That's, that's a process that sure. isn't necessarily difficult. It's, hard, it's difficult for a reason. And just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we should like, you know, fall back on ad hominems or like these logical fallacies and these arguments and bitter and resentment. I almost feel like I don't even want to get involved in the block size debate because it's just something where everyone loses. Everyone loses. A pig, you know, if you get into a fight with a pig, you get dirty and the pig enjoys it. So what's the point? Don't even bother. Don't even engage. Well, just, the point is we need to move forward. How can yeah, we solve people this? Yeah, but people can Can we like can Can we, oh no. Just action. Action. Like code. Oh. Going on Twitter every day is easy. Like just yelling at people and calling them names and launching a propaganda, even if it just happens to be funny every now and again, isn't proper action. Like that's a form of action, but it's a form of low grade work. Like maybe you're helping to spread awareness of an argument and you believe that's the right thing to do. But unless you're actually building something or constructing something, I don't think you're, you're inputting high grade work. Now, personally, I don't think I've contributed enough in the last 12 months. I did a lot with the Full Note project, you know, before and project, mm -hmm. but this is something I'm trying to address and I'm getting back into things now. I'm coping a little bit better with my, with my uh, headaches and so forth and my situation and my health. And so, yeah, I want to start getting back into these full nodes and encouraging people to understand why it's important to run one, for example. I think work like this is important because I think art always helps to inspire people into to thinking something, at least something that people can take away with them afterwards, right? It changes, it changes the way people's, people think. So I really like what Crypto Graffiti has done in here. But also, you know, the Full Note project was an art project. Right? Well, sure, and speaking of art projects and Bitcoin, how did you get started making Bitcoin art projects? I know you made a lot of videos, and we talked about the 260 spike, and I know after that I started making Mad Bitcoins videos, and a little while later I started making Bitcoin group videos, and a little while after that I started making World Crypto Network videos with you and Andreas. Yeah. We would do a lot of long-form interviews. I know after the the Senate hearings where they talk about Bitcoin and then after uh, one of the major crashes, the Mt. Gox crash, 
we all got together live on YouTube yeah, and we just kind of started talking and I know there's a lot of panic and a lot of fear in our community. We could tell in the chat rooms and the things that people were asking and questions and we just got on and, and started talking to them. So yeah. why do you think that was good? Why was that worthwhile? Andy Warhol said that the best form of business was art. Uh, be an artist, right? Because the difference between art and business is as a business person, if I make a mistake, it's my fuck up and I believe it. Right. If I'm an artist and I make a mistake, it just becomes part of the art. Sure. Right? So there's that, there's that element to it. But also as an artist, I've got more freedom. I can say things that business people can't say because I don't have KPI metrics. I don't have investors to answer to. You can the destroy people are my investors. You're my investor right here at home. And you do not put the same kind of pressures on me as a VC who feels self-important just because they've got lots of money. Right? I don't care if you've got lots of money. Maybe you stole it. I don't know how you got it. That doesn't make you a good person to me. But if you um, reach out to me on the internet, like so many of you have on Twitter or on, on YouTube, I can start to build a relationship with you. I can start to make decisions about you know, what kind of person you are. Do our values align? And if I like you and you like my work, um, I think your friend Sarah said it the other day in a private conversation we were having, there are no guns in this transaction. You made a voluntary payment. I gave you the work, and if you liked it, that's great, and you'll continue to, to give and, and support our work. And that's not a donation, that's not begging, that's just paying. That's just called a value for value exchange. And we don't want, or I personally don't want, anyone to not be able to benefit from my work. So I don't want to put a paywall down in front of my videos. I don't want to force people uh, to, to do something that they're, they're not capable of doing, uh, which is paying in order to, to limit their ability to access my work. So with the full note thing, with the prototype thing, there was always free point of entry. There was always like a free way to engage with the work that I was producing. Sure, if you wanted one of the limited edition nodes, then you, you would pay for that. But I open sourced the instructions. There was really not a lot stopping you from reading those instructions and building a full node yourself from, from your own parts. And I encourage people, people to do that. So that's what I think this community is about. And I think if everyone did it, or even if 50% more of the community that spend all their time trolling on Reddit did what we were doing, we would have an exponential increase of value in the industry. And that's true. Everyone needs to do their own and take, be a part of it. Yeah. To join in and take a part, we're waiting for you. And I noticed that with a lot of your projects, you're really just taking other projects and putting them together, similar to what Linus did with Linux and the open source tools, what Satoshi did with Bitcoin, and what you did with like the World Citizenship ID project. Mm -hmm. You took several off-the-shelf tools and stitched them together to create a new idea. Is that something that like people at home could do? Yeah. Can they see a, a situation like this where unconnected ideas have not been connected yeah. and then kind so of do something original by connecting them? Right, it's combinatorial innovation, mm -hmm. right? And so the pro first problem is slap slaptivism. Right. This concept of slacktivism where people think they're contributing just by going on Reddit and shouting and screaming and calling names and so on. That is not really activism. You're not doing very much. Like it's a form of action, sure, energy is going in, there is some output that is produced, but it's not high grade energy, right, that you're using. It's low grade. So anyone can go onto Reddit and anyone can have an opinion and anyone can shout at somebody else. It takes real skill and, and courage actually and uniqueness to go off and think of your own original concept, conceptual design, right? It's especially difficult in this days with the remakes and the sequels and yeah. the, the feeling that like it's all been done. Yeah, and there's yeah, exactly. this in, such a record and so many great artists and you try to compare yourself as a minor artist against a great right. artist, again, who might have worked 30 years to write, to get to the point to write that book or that sculpture or that painting. Um, but they can get through that. They can make yeah. their own, even in this difficult situation. Of right, right. So it's all about you and your personal story, right? There is some problem that deep down you know how to solve because you've suffered it yourself. So I would encourage you to start thinking about what is it that you've got to contribute? What is it that only you can offer? Some personal experience to you, something that you've been through, something that you feel defines your existence to some extent. Like, for me, I was always a scam man. For some reason, scammers love me. They always attract themselves to me. I always find myself surrounded by them. So I have this empathy for people that also fall victim to scammers or just have these really controlling people in their lives that, that try to always extract things from them. I never felt like I was, before I got into Bitcoin, I never felt like I had the right people around me who could help me be the best version of myself. And I struggled with that. Like, I had ideas that I felt were really creative and people just didn't listen to them. When I got into Bitcoin, 
I've only realized not soon after I was in Feathercoin that actually there were a whole group of other people who really just wanted to have some impact. We were very naive back in those days, in the Feathercoin days, because yeah. there weren't very many coins around, so it was still very novel, and we thought we were making a valuable contribution sure. with, with Feathercoin. It was a, more of a scientific right. experiment than an economic one. Yeah. No one was ICOing or trying no, to there was no Dogecoin back then. Just overloading. There was, there was Namecoin, there was Peercoin, there was Feathercoin, there was Barbecue Coin, although that wasn't really doing very much. But those were the only coins that, that really existed, like Terracoin. Yeah, those were the only really coins that existed. So there weren't very really many of them. So we didn't feel like the work we were doing was redundant. What I realized though, after like a year or a year and a half of working there, is I sort of realized actually, it was when anti got happened. Right. I realized that the real project was Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we have to focus on. It's not that I have, um, you know, deep but philosophical you, objections. You could have been a huge leader of Feathercoin. No, Bitcoin no, no, is the big pool. It's the, no, 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 no. What the mistake I made was thinking that Bitcoin was scary, right? Mm. So if I went onto the Git repo, what I saw was a lot of very smart people, and that intimidated me. Sure. That's I didn't want to get involved right. with like Peter Wooler and like you know people like this. They seem so smart. I was like, I'll never be able to get in this conversation. Mm. They're just going to call me and they're going to think I'm an idiot. They're going to, you know. So I didn't want to get involved. Whereas with Feathercoin it was a much smaller community, much more close knit. There were some technical people, some non technical people, and it felt easier just to get into the, the flow of things and have a contribution. And you know, we got into sort of pub, a couple of places started accepting Feathercoin in Oxford. It was a local thing, that was what was in it for me. I mean, I, there were people that I could meet up with in the UK and go to these meetups and, and actually work on something. We thought, you know, this is great. But what I realized was that actually Bitcoin was. The, the project and the mistake I think I made in hindsight was that actually I didn't have to go to, to GitHub and, and necessarily ask for well, first of all my fear was, was misguided and I shouldn't have been fearful but second of all I could have just done anything without their approval I didn't need the permission there was something inside of me I think that felt like I needed to ask Gavin Andreessen at the time like I had to ask his permission in See, order to I, do something. I felt I that way. I don't need to that. ask anyone's permission. I can just do whatever I want. That's a little bit of the Wizard of Oz there, where right. the, the Tin Man has the heart and he has the courage, but he feels he has to ask the wizard for it. And the real truth is mm. that like you are the wizard. Yeah. And one of the <laughs> things I did when I made my show is I gave myself the permission to make a YouTube show. Right. And I'd never done that before. I had no experience doing that. And it could have been a total train wreck. And maybe it was. Maybe some of the episodes are bad. I like them, but I can't tell. <laughs> um, but I went out there and I, I, you know, tried to fail. They're all good. And I went for that. Yeah. They're classic. They're classic. <laughs> classic. Well, there's certainly historical documents now, and they're out there. And what, what I also think we should talk about is like practice and repetition over time, and that this is how you get better. You don't get better by not writing a book. You get better by writing five shitty books. <laughs> and I know that's hard for everyone. And you're like, but why would I write a shitty book? And it's like, well, you have to write five shitty ones to write a good one. And that's especially true with video and maybe even with Bitcoin and contributions and programming and everything. It's that ability to fail and to continue. Yeah. And a lot of people I know, I know a lot of smart people, I'm a pretty smart person, but sometimes you can't fail. Sometimes you don't know how to get up after you fail, or you don't know how to challenge into subjects that you're not good at. And I think that's a part of, of growing and learning that mm -hmm. people need to do more of is to- it's Turning into like a Tony Robbins kind of. Right? I want the audience to be inspired. <laughs> yeah. If they it's like a it this far, video. They're, they're, they're in need of inspiration. Buy now! Buy the DVD now! Like what was <laughs> you can buy this whole session on DVD or come to our workshop for $1,500 at this expensive hotel for a weekend. Yeah. You can buy one coin. Or sell it yeah, one coin. It's going to double one. in October. It's a joke. Don't buy it. It's a scam. The World Crypto Network. I'm the architect. Paper wallet. There's a guy called Bitcoin on Twitter, and I want to take this opportunity now to kind of answer. I said earlier in my tweet to you that I would give you a more nuanced response to this. So what happened earlier was Tweetcoin, uh, Bitcoin tweeted me with a quote of something that I said back in October in response to a comment that he had made about Litecoin. And he says, big analysis, breakdown with big major updates. All coins should now be long-term bearish. Okay, this was back in October, 2016. And I responded, yeah, each coin appeals to a different niche, increasing the net diversity within the whole ecosystem over time. Now, what he's done is, I've recently tweeted, um, you know, how do I buy a new kitchen with rare pepes? Number one, buy early. Number two, shill hard. Number three, bro down. And I said, you know, in response to that, let's turn the youth into a generation of pyramid sellers, okay? 
So Bitcoin. As long as you get in early, you're fine. Yeah. So Bitcoin has come in and very, very astutely quoted my tweet from back in October when I said that all coins add diversity and bring in a new niche over time. Okay. So that's a nice juxtaposition, and it would appear that if you put my two comments side by side like that, that they appear to contradict themselves. So I want to take this opportunity now to answer you in a more nuanced way. So this, my thought pattern. Uh, comes from a long conversation I've had with a guy called Mr. Hoddle. He is uh, on Twitter and also on the Whale Pool Team Speak channel. And he is a Bitcoin maximalist, I'm a Bitcoin minimalist, kind of sort of the same thing. And we, so we share a lot of the same values. And he basically, his philosophy is Bitcoin is the one and only, and he holds Bitcoin long term and he has paper wallets, he doesn't trade much, you know, just keeps it and holds it for the long term. So my position with him when we've been talking about the value of altcoins is, okay, given my experience with Feathercoin, now I've seen how that kind of plays out, how that kind of developed over time. My current position is, I find the existence of these altcoins and that particularly their community members quite insidious. I find that whole kind of like shill culture and this sort of marketing and I go into the Slack channels and it's just PR people and dev biz dev people. There's no like engineers. Like when, when can I speak to a fucking coder? Like where's the documentation? How do I implement this? How do I build this? What is the value proposition? What are you adding overall? So this is all I've always sort of had this conversation. We go back and forth. And what we've kind of realized is that, okay, these all coins exist, but they kind of exist because Bitcoin, as we said at the beginning of this show, is open source. So we can't stop them from doing it. We might not like the culture that it creates and sort of cult, cult, you know, cultism. It's like a, a cult. These people just like fervently will never back down. Their coin is the best coin ever, but they're speaking from self-interest. They're speaking because they hold that coin, they're holding that bag, oh, and they need the price to go up. So what Mr. Holland worked out was that everyone eventually wants to go back to Bitcoin. So even if it's detrimental and it's really shitty and it's you know got some scammy elements to it, it all flows back into Bitcoin eventually because when Bitcoin goes up, the alts go down, everyone goes back into Bitcoin because most of these altcoins don't have a USD pair because it's difficult for the exchanges to get licenses and get regulated to do USD pairing. So most of them don't even bother. Most of these altcoins trade against Bitcoin because that's the simplest economic solution for exchanges like Poloniex, for example, for them to, to be able to do. So you, your altcoin trades with Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin starts shooting up, no matter how much you say you believe in rare fucking Pepe or whatever the new thing is, you're gonna go, your self-interest is purchasing power. I want to have purchasing power. So over time, the last part of my statement in that tweet that Bitcoin retweeted was over time. So eventually what happens is everyone goes back into Bitcoin and they hold Bitcoin. And they sell into fiat, and then they regret it, and they don't do it again, and they just hold big. So that, that was the point that I wanted to make. That was the nuance I couldn't put into 140 characters. So I hope that makes more sense. And yes, ostensibly those two statements you tweeted do appear to contradict each other. I'm just not saying it's a good thing that these all coins exist. But I think overall, longer term, like um, Blake was saying, he made an argument to me once. It's like porn on the internet. Yeah, it was one of those early things. Porn was just like, it was ubiquitous all over the web but it's just something you kind of have to put up with. Well, that's a different example, but I would go back towards, you said that the altcoin groups are kind of like cults. How would you compare this to Linux distros? We yeah. have these distributions like Slackware and Red Hat and Ubuntu nowadays, and people were really into them. They each had their own features, they yeah. ran their own code set, but they were similar to the original Linux, if there is such a thing, or the most basic version of FreeBSD or whatever you want to call your baseline there but is this the same but it's different because of the money yeah so you said that when they settle they get the money and that they want the, the funds thing is, if you run slackware or something you just you know, Linux, wear a different t-shirt with think. Linux, there's like an ideology behind sure. it the, the, you know you support your distro because yeah. of some bsd ideology. is a freedom issue this one yeah. has better drivers it appeals it's to your software heart. issue it's there's Whereas a technical reason for these all points it's financial, let's face it. Yeah, like, what if you nine like, times out of ten, you you give a fuck about it, your your financial. You're saying that it's not like, the emotional connection no. with the Doge. It's not the economic connection with having a billion units. Okay, there may have been. I, I admit, with Featherpoint Dogecoin and some of the other coins, there may have been a genuine emotional and uh, you psychological. know psychological att attachment to the philosophy behind the project. Okay. I agree that Dogecoin was a, was a good initiative initially. It was like every every you know industry has its fluffy brand. Every industry has its 
te teddy bear brand, okay? And that was kind of what Dogecoin was for crypto. And I felt like at the time, before it turned all cultish and um, Andrew was a, uh, Jackson sort of resigned. Before everything. it was a colorful way to spam people. Yeah. It yeah. was just colorful. It was just fun. It was yeah. fun initially, right. and then it became, it became a little bit more pernicious. And, and then it was like the Mint Power fiasco. And it went up and, up and it went down. But, and people but, started losing money. Remember Redcoin, R E D D? Oh sure. my God, those were such trolls. They, they were social social coin. all they the time. Twitter, and, they had some tipping. They had applications to use their coins. They were so obnoxious. They were, if you said one negative thing about red coin, that was so. But now, here's how the test. This is how you test it. A single red coiner now will not comment on this video because it's dead. No one cares about red coin anymore. No one's invested in it. So no, it's, no it's one's incentivized like, to troll us today. A lot right? of the projects. If, but if you slag off Amanda coin, if I slag off Amanda coin, I'm sorry, Dash. Keep calling Amanda coin. Why do I keep calling Amanda coin? She's so popular. D Dash or Dark coin or whatever it's called now. Um, if I slag off that, I'm going to get shitloads of trolls because there are lots of people that are financially invested in Dash today that are financially motivated to protect it. But a year from now, two years from now, no one's going to care because there'll, there'll be another new thing on the block. There'll be some other new project that people are going to be I invested in. I, I got some like, great coins back in the day. One time I got $1,000 in mega coin. Mega. And of course, like I want to respect the people I held it. I think I ended up with $200 in mega coin. <laughs> but you know, that's the way yeah. sometimes. There are so many coins. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't disagree in principle. Now, there's going the to be more, right? We know we know there's going to be more coins. Right now we're in the, what, 100 coins maybe? Oh, yeah, more, way more. 500, 500 but still, 500. as opposed to like tens of thousands, hundreds yeah, of yeah. thousands. Like we, are, like we are gonna see the actual, I believe, the true legion of these coins or tokens or signatures of value or whatever you want to call yeah. them. They're going to. I mean, the point is you can't, you can't stop them, and nor should you try. Because, because you can't stop people from forking over. But there should be only one, and I'm a maximalist. But you can't force that on anyone. But you, can, but you can't force that on anyone. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to do it, they can, and they should, not be, they should not be free from your criticism. They should absolutely feel like you can troll them, and they should not have, you know, they certainly don't have, the, you know, I wouldn't say the right, but, I mean, it's their prerogative, okay? It's your prerogative if you're a dash holder right now and you want to troll me in the comments. It's your prerogative. I can't stop you from doing that. Um, but also, likewise, if you want to go create an altcoin, you said, certainly if you want to create a corporation around it, you want to create a head of biz dev, you want to have a headquarters in Arizona or whatever, and you want to do all this marketing and financing and pre mining stuff, expect to get some criticism. Expect people to say, how is this different to Liberty? Oh, what, what if I just got it? into the space and I don't know about this? Because I've met people at the meetup where, I mean, I'm pretty critical of new altcoins now. It's kind of, you're a scam unless you're proven otherwise. Yeah. And it takes a lot of proof to get by that. Even right. some of these that are, they're legit businesses this year. They have a full staff. They have PR, marketing, engineering. They have all this stuff. They're working on it. But the next year, they're nothing. Yeah. And I've been in this a couple of years now, which is a lot in Bitcoin time. And to see these people come back and just be so excited about uh, whatever their new altcoin is and yeah. super ready to pump it. What do we say to those people that are just starting and then they're out there, they're into it and they're maybe in another coin that's not Bitcoin? How Get do we say Bitcoin? Get into Bitcoin. <laughs> I don't know. What, do, do you before or after their, research, their one dumps? Research. Like, should I wait till my coin dumps? Should I, I guess emotionally I have to learn the lesson, right? Have yeah, to, you have to learn the lesson. You have to have a broken heart, right? Yeah. There's no way, I can't, you can't I'll never be able to explain I can't make your mistakes for you. Mm. you just got to do what you think is right and do your own research and hedge accordingly. They won't. They'll never they hedge. You'll you screw say up. that nonsense. You'll learn. Don't invest more than you can lose. I, and that's yeah. nonsense. You Definitely just over invest. Yeah. Lose more than you can afford. Yes. And then learn that lesson well. And, and gain a lot too. Like these Dash people who said it was like at 40 bucks. They're up I'll like four right. times or right. 400%. That's fantastic, but maybe you should sell. Maybe you should buy yourself something nice. Maybe some food. You know, but that kind of thing. Yeah. Sounds good. Right. Legit. Blockchain. Obsolete. I see dead currency. What about the future? What about philosophy? How is Bitcoin and open source different? How is Bitcoin and open source different? Than what we've done in the past. In the past, yeah. companies okay. would own an idea. Yeah, yeah. In the future, maybe they would open source it. Satoshi could have created a company mm. to own Bitcoin. Yeah. He had a lot of programmers, a lot of copyrights, and 
patents. We've seen with Craig Wright is now attempting to patent Bitcoin. But the idea of Bitcoin as Satoshi presented is an open source idea. How is that different? Well, let's start with open source. So the idea of open source is that when you create a work, you're giving up the right to control it. You're giving up your ability in the future to capture it, preserve it, exercise any rights over it. But that's scary. Why would I want to do that? Yeah, exactly. I like to control everything. I've said all along that Bitcoin's most important feature is its open source nature. It would have been the easiest thing in the world for Satoshi to have closed sourced it. The first thing the companies do when you walk into their offices is they make you sign on disclosure agreements. The first instinct of any corporate entity is to close things off. Particularly if venture capitalists are involved, they instantly want to know what's the secret source. What have you got that everyone else doesn't have? What can we protect? It's like the game of Monopoly. You want to get all the best hotels on the board and just charge as much rent as you possibly can. So it's about capturing, it's about land grab. With Bitcoin, the, the philosophy was that this belongs to everyone. Everyone and nobody controls it. And this has presented some unique problems because you know in the past with Linux, people could just keep on creating their own distros and, and remixing and sharing. But what Bitcoin has that those open source projects don't have is it has the property of digital scarcity. So now you have this, this, this thing called, a, we call it a blockchain. It's essentially a links list. That's the concept in computer science. So it's a linear array. And you can only say one message once in the blockchain, to put it differently. You can't repeat the same message twice in a blockchain. Once you make a message, that message is unique. You try making the same message again, you're going to get a different output, right? The hash is going to be different because each block hash is unique and each unspent transaction output from input to output is essentially a state transition system, right? So it's turning inputs into outputs and each and every one is unique each and every time. So and even if the characters of the message are the same, yes. the hashed or converted version, the raw message, the raw, the raw transaction is different every single time, even if the meaning is the same, even if the value of, 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 uh, that's transferred is the same. It's the same cup of coffee, or it still equals $1.60, or it still equals one Bitcoin. It looks the same, but underneath it, it's different. And this is different to, to the way we transacted before with uh, TCP IP and UDP, for example, where in order to get a message across, you had to have amplitude. So you had to re keep rebroadcasting the message over and over again. You had to keep back, get lots of backlinks for the ind indexing websites like uh, Google and Yahoo. Uh, to, to, to rank you higher on that table of contents of the web and you have to keep getting louder and louder. With a blockchain you only have to tell the truth once. You only have to make a statement once. And once it's in there, it's repeated and it's spread across the network and it can simply be addressed. And you don't suffer from the similar problems like with HTTP where you get link rot, where you know, a website goes down so you read an old blog from 10 years ago and you try clicking on the links and they don't work anymore. The idea is that you have this perfectly preserved you know, stateful systems, this database, that is like a, a sort of a globally shared um, discourse, a, a global conversation in which nobody can disagree with the outcome, right? Every time you send a transaction on the blockchain, you broadcast it and it's relayed by the full nodes and the miner eventually confirms it and puts it into a block. No one is going to disagree with that, that state transition. So it's a monetary conversation though. We're, com yeah, we're sending kind value. Of. Yeah, but you're also, right. you're also making a claim. Like forget, forget um, let's go back to, to first principles. Forget the concepts like money and economics and politics just right now. Mm -hmm. Let's start out with the basics. Essentially, you're making a claim. When you, when you transmit uh, something to the blockchain, you're making a claim. In, specifically, initially, what you're saying is that I own this private key and I've signed a message that makes a claim about an unspent transaction output that my public key has the ability to transfer to somebody else's public private key there. And that is a claim. But until a full node receives it, validates it, until a miner confirms it, it doesn't form part of the consensus. So the, the whole world can still be you know, in limbo about your transaction, about the truthfulness of your claim, until it's confirmed. And so this digital scarcity, to bring us back to our original point, gives us unique problems because now anyone can fork Bitcoin, they can fork it and put in a new Genesis block like Litecoin did and just make some modifications to the code, increase the coin supply, change the hashing algorithm or you could fork Bitcoin and take the whole UTXO set from a given block height. So you can say at block height 400,000 
we're going to take all the unspent transaction outputs, so everyone's balances currently on the, on the blockchain, and we're simply going to copy it and then create a separate blockchain, and those unspent transaction outputs will be duplicated. So all those balances will exist in two chains, the original blockchain, the original Bitcoin, and the new one as well. So you'd have the same shared history, but you'd have a breaking off yeah. just where it and would be different from then on. Yes, now on paper, what it looks like you know, is double the supply of coins because now you've given people the Everybody's ability. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. Well, we saw it with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. What tends to happen is a market dynamic opens up, and then the market has to adjust and work out um, what the future value is going to be of, of the new one versus the old one, and what is the opportunity risk of holding this one over this one. And it, it's not going to work itself out straight away. It's going to take time for people to. Well, first of all, you've got this problem that people tend to leave too much money on exchanges. So first thing that's going to happen is the exchanges are going to upgrade that wallet software. They're either going to give users the ability to spend the transactions, like with Ethereum Classic. Not all exchanges upgraded to Ethereum Classic. Of and Ethereum Coinbase. Coinbase. Really, I'm not sure they've provided the Ethereum Classic. To but when Ethereum exchange. Classic continued the chain, because Ethereum Classic is the original Ethereum. Ethereum, the hard fork one, which, the, which was sponsored by the foundation, that, that was a new chain that had some uh, you know, new properties built into it. So what happened was, in theory, everyone's private key from the original chain, what we now call Ethereum Classic, still existed on the original network as well as the new one. The reason it didn't feel like that is because of all the back channel that was going on. It was the fact the Ethereum Foundation, Ethereum people were calling exchanges and getting them to, you know, proactively engaging them to install this new version and just tell their customers this is still the old Ethereum. So well, this is the new one. And users weren't really given a whole lot of choice, but what you didn't realize was, if you had a private key with unspent transactions, uh, actually Ethereum doesn't have UTXOs, but let's say it does, the, 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 the unspent balance, let's call it. Um, if you still had an unspent balance uh, and a private key from Ethereum from before, then you were still able to spend those coins on both networks. Bitcoin, yeah, we've got that. What is this? Watch the World Crypto Network, or something like that. So we were talking about the possibility of the blockchain forking and Chris was describing the way that Ethereum Classic happened and maybe people are wondering why we're talking about that. Chris, could Bitcoin split into two forks? Is that something that we're looking at in the future? Yeah, in theory it could split into two forks. Um, and this could have happened at any point in its history. It's always been a possibility. And if we don't test this mm -hmm. early, yeah. then it will always remain an unknown. So I think it's important that, you know, if people are, certain people in the community are going to threaten to fork the chain with it, its sure. full UCXO set intact, such that people can spend both their old Bitcoins and their new Bitcoins on the new chain and double the supply in, you know, in, in effect, um, then someone needs to do that. And Bitcoin needs to, in the same way that it's responded to challenges in the past, like the Silk Road going down and MC Gox and all these other existential threats that it's faced, to its institution, it also needs to face this threat too. And we need to see it come through, most recently with the SEC. And so yes, I think it needs to be challenged. Now the basic idea recently is that people, the big blockers, want larger blocks to have more transactions, while the Bitcoin core people seem to be interested in segregated witness or separate signatures, which would store the signatures separately, get us maybe a meg and a half, almost two megs, and then would lead to a soft fork which may lead to an additional block size increase down the line. Whereas the other people want a hard fork, which is two chains, right? And a soft fork is more like software you can upgrade and then keep running. Whereas the other one, there's an incompatibility between the new coins and the old coins. They can't function together. Right, so first of all, what I like about Bitcoin is it's just lots of individuals with different overlapping ideas right? and beliefs. So what I like is that there isn't like some company at the top or some like, you know, head of business development or PR and, you know, like the Ethereum Foundation has all these roles and these people in suits and they make these public statements in the press and they respond to things. Whereas Bitcoin doesn't have that. It's just a motley crew of individuals who, you know, sometimes you might agree with one thing that they say and then in another, you know, another case you might completely disagree with that thing that but, person. But would it be but it's not homogenous. If we had a foundation, would it be simpler? Would the ideas come sooner? Because the problem is we've we've looked like it's not kind of jerks. We've been kind of hanging out for a year, maybe two years now on this scaling. It's just a community. It's just a community of people 
and the press likes to characterize it in one way, like I've seen we're libertarians apparently. apparently. I don't know what that means, it's not helpful to the I conversation. Would call, I would call this status because <laughs> I believe in seatbelts. Yeah, okay. So, um, so, sorry. These sweeping generalizations don't help us learn anything, and it's not a company, it's not really an organization as such because it's quite emergent. Mm -hmm. Like things just happen in Bitcoin, someone will do something. It's completely unanticipated. Sure. They didn't tell other people they were going to do it first. There was no forewarning. Something will just happen. The community responds to that. It's spontaneous and it's emergent. It's not like a company where there are private meetings and then those private meetings, you know, have back channels and then some people have expectations and then, you know, press releases, you know, come out and things happen. It's not like that. It's not coordinated. It's completely spontaneous. And this idea that there are big blockers and small blockers and all this name calling and this focus on tone and this focus on as in you know vocal tone vocal tone, uh, vocal tone <laughs> and con and focus on personality isn't doing us any good at all you know trying to bank you know but there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a banking of bitcoin and then you know this so is she's left this space if, yeah. if we're linux we've lost our linux i would have left too frankly in the state of the forum was in at the time I would have fucked off as well, you know. So you have to appreciate his patience in the beginning. The, the things like him describing and designing the logo, the things like him putting these posts on message boards, hey, anyone want to help spread the word? Is the kind of thing I, I wish I could time travel back and hear his call. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful to Hal Finney, and I forget the other gentleman's name, but the other people who helped him during this time and really answered Satoshi's call. Bitcoin! 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 Subscribe! Bitcoin. Satoshi Nakamoto, Hal Finney, and that anonymous person that made that great contribution on Bitcoin talk, and I'm never gonna know who it was. Subscribe! You are watching the World Crypto Network. All right. All right? What? Right. What else do you wanna do, man? Don't know, what do you want? Fapa latte. You don't answer, you just sit there looking at us like that. Fapa latte. Put that in the outtakes. Fapa latte.